Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. My name is Joshua Lewis. Today, we're going to be discussing Jezzy B, the spirit of Jezebel. Hide your kids, hide your wife. It's going to be a crazy episode. <laughs> you are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and nations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Guys, that better not be any indication of how today's show is going to go. I tell you what, that is not great. Not great. Provoked the ire of Jezzy B. The (laughs) Jezebel spirit (laughs) stopping you. Guys, this is is something. I don't know. Or are there tech demons? Is there such a thing Probably. as tech demons? We need to do a whole Probably episode tech about demons. tech demons. You got to yeah. Cast once we them figure out. them out, if we we got no authority in that ground, bro. Yeah, There's just no question. No, we got, no one has authority over if that. If we knew how that man. worked, we would not have the problems that we have. Are you seeing the live feed right now? We've got no. people on there criticizing us for being too soft. Uh, we haven't even started the conversation. We haven't even started. We're a bunch of softies. <laughs> hey, Wait, it's funny well, how we get that on both sides too soft or too harsh and it's like it's never it's never the right amount never enough yeah if you're in the right, middle so, middle of the road you get hit by both sides of traffic guys that's just classic illustration go. hey so we're talking about the jezebel yep. spirit today uh josh talk us through i mean first of all what why is this even a conversation Okay, yeah, this is a conversation primarily because uh, tons and tons of uh, charismatics uh, speak of the Jezebel spirit, of which we are. We're all charismatics here. Um, and yeah, uh, everyone, yourself, Josh. Everyone, uh, everyone has a theory on what the Jezebel spirit is. And we don't really use Jezebel spirit in a very precise way. Uh, sometimes people will use Jezebel spirit to say uh, the kind of psychological profile of an individual who is a manipulator an individual who is maybe sexually immoral. Uh, Sometimes they'll talk about it as a spirit, like a principality that has like authority over a region or a church. Uh, And then at times they'll talk about it as ideology, like this demonic doctrines and strongholds that people have in their mind. Uh, And then they live out that kind of doctrine and stronghold. Like they'd say the radical feminist movement is inspired by the spirit of Jezebel. So a couple different ways. And what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, but especially in the uh, in the charismatic world, the Jezebel spirit has become a teaching that the pastors have been uh, engaging in this for generations. Hey, you need to know about the Jezebel spirit, and they'll list the different characteristics and uh, it, and what they mean by Jezebel spirit. And this was one of the three options that you listed was that this is a literal demon that makes people act like Jezebel, right. and so. Uh, there's a seductive quality that this spirit attacks leaders just as Jezebel, uh, you know, (coughs) excuse me, manipulated Ahab, uh, that there's idolatry involved, there's sexual immorality involved and and so on. And so they'll detail all the characteristics of this is what the Jezebel spirit does. And if you're a leader, a church leader in the body of Christ, you can expect to be attacked by a Jezzy B spirit. You can expect it, and here's the things to, here are the things to look for. And so are you giggling over there? So, well, I, I've, I've heard the same thing. Like I've literally told uh, a number of different times, especially when I first moved to Denver to plant the church, I was told, hey, the Jezebel spirit is strong here. You need to be ready for it. Wait, uh, are you serious? Careful. Like people oh, are yeah. saying the Jezzy B spirit is real strong in Denver? Yeah, yeah. And is, is that I mean, why you guys fair, legalized marijuana so quickly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're more manipulative <laughs> when you get behind it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, again, though, I think these these are friends of mine, incredibly well-meaning, and they've just seen havoc <coughs> in, in churches. Yeah. And, well, and we're, so this, we're is, being, this is how they've labeled that havoc. We're, we're being kind of silly with it here, but uh, the, the reality is, I mean, many people do believe there is a Jezebel spirit, and we want to test it from the scripture and determine, is there actually such a thing as a Jezebel spirit? So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to begin with the Old Testament and sort of profile Jezebel herself, talk through the different characteristics. Uh, we'll also look at the New Testament, and then we'll look at a few different options of... Uh, 
of where we might land in terms of is this a spirit or is it something different? So we'll kind of walk through. That'll be sort of a, a pathway that we're going to walk through today. Uh, so Josh, uh, why, don't, why don't you kick us off on the Old Testament discussion, just walking us through uh, characteristics of Jezebel. Sure, yeah. A uh, couple characteristics of Jezebel will kind of proof text a lot of this for you. Uh, she led her husband into idolatry, right? We see this in uh, 1 Kings 16, 30 through 31. Um, uh, and Ahab, son of Omir, uh, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Uh, and as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of uh, Nebat, uh, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Balaam in the house of Baal, uh, which he built in Samaria, and Ahab made an Ashereth. Uh, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than any king of Israel who who were before him. So uh, Jezebel is uh, the, the daughter of a specific king. Uh, this specific king uh, would have worshipped Baal and Asherah. Uh, and it seems as if there is a correlation uh, between like the commandments we see in Deuteronomy uh, 7, where he says, don't intermarry uh, from other nations because their women will like turn your heart and lead you astray after other gods. Uh, it seems as if that's exactly what is done here. Uh, Jezebel introduces these false gods to uh, the king, and we'll kind of dive into some of her profile a little bit here in a second, but it does seem as if there is a probability, a high probability, uh, that she is the high priestess of the Ashereth temple uh, because of her relation to uh, the king, the former king, uh, that she served under her father's reign. Uh, the, his, the king's daughters were often high priestesses in those temples. Absolutely. And so Asherah was worshipped through ritual sex. And so there was also uh, this strong sort of sexual immorality connotation uh, associated with Jezebel. And uh, and you start to see this in the New Testament in Revelation 2, uh, a sexual immorality and idolatry connection. Uh, both of these actually come together since Asherah was worshipped through ritual sex. Um, now, Josh, let's talk about Josh or Michael. Uh, why don't we uh, hop to you, Michael? Uh, can you read the the passage about um, uh, about Jezebel manipulating to get her way with uh, Naboth's vineyard? Yeah, yeah. So this is First Kings chapter twenty one, verses five through ten. It said, but Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, "Why is your spirit so vexed that you that you eat no food?" And he said to her, "Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreel, Jezreelite." And said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it please you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Do you now govern Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote the letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. And she sent the letters to the elders and the leaders who lived in Naboth in the city. And she wrote in the letters, proclaim a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people and set two worthless men opposite him and let them bring a charge against him, saying, you have cursed God and the king, then take him out and stone him to death. Yoinks. Yeah, so so yeah. this is just a plot. The, the, the following verses yeah. describe that actually happening, where she does get worthless men to, to bring false charges and they do stone him. And okay. Ahab does, in fact, get the vineyard. Right. I can tell you this, and man. So, when... When someone brings that kind of accusation against you, uh, I can understand why you would want to call them a Jezebel. <laughs> it, makes, it makes perfect sense when you read that. Yeah. You go, someone does yeah. that to me. Well, going, yeah, you know she's what, got Michael, though, that touches on uh, an important one reason why this is important that the, the word Jezebel can be an insulting term. Like, oh, you're just that she's a Jezebel, you know, and probably some of you who are watching have been called a Jezebel. It can be uh, extremely painful to get that kind of label. And so uh, I think it's important that we have this kind of conversation because it does, uh, it, it it can become a danger of demonizing people. And and in fact, and you, you can see this and uh, that, that the label Jezebel has actually been used throughout history to speak of uh, African-American women uh, in terms of like it's a racial slur. 
yeah, it's a pretty horrific thing. And, uh, and that itself, that labeling, uh, being evil. So, um, so we, we want to be real careful and just like throwing around a label here. Now back to Naboth's vineyard. Uh, if you hear somebody teaching on the Jezebel spirit, they might, uh, they might mention this story and they'll say, uh, you know, Jez the, this Jezebel spirit, she's just real forceful about getting her way or, uh, sh and she'll, uh, use the, you know, she'll uh, get the king to kind of do what she want, uh, whatever she wants. And, you know, you can see in this story that uh, that King Ahab just becomes sort of like this puppet and and she becomes like sort of the true ruler. And so the Jezebel spirit is this real manipulative spirit, coercive spirit, a spirit that just sort of gets its way and affects leaders. And, uh, and so you hear these kind of things. And so they'll point to the story and say, therefore, there is a Jezebel spirit. Now, let's, uh, let's keep reading. There's a story about, uh, Josh, I don't know. Do you want to get into the story of Jehu or not? Yeah, I can, I can quickly run through Jehu. Uh, Second Kings, uh, this is after uh, Elisha leaves. He anoints Jehu and he anoints Elisha to take his place. Jehu came to Jezreel. Jezreel heard of it. Uh, and she painted, or I'm sorry, Jezebel uh, heard of it. And she painted her eyes and adorned her uh, head and looked out of the window and as Jehu entered the gate she said it is is it peace with you Zimri murder of the ma of your master uh, here in this verse couple things important to notice you'll see that she painted her face um, she walked out to the window and she calls him uh, Zimri. This is probably referring to a former king who took power by murdering someone else. Um, the prior verse, though, where she painted her face, um, there is a theologian by the name of Richard D. Nelson who suggests that this is an attempt to seduce Jehu. Um, that he assumes that Jehu is going to take over um, the uh, the harem of women, and she wants to be a part of said harem uh, to get some kind of protection from Jehu. Uh, so we see, again, going through this list one after the other, we see, uh, one, that she led her husband into idolatry. Two, um, she is going to manipulate situations and individuals to get her her, her way. Uh, three, uh, she tried to seduce um, Jehu. So there is like a sexual immorality sort of manipula manipulation. There's a forceful will sort of situation. There's leading people into worship of false gods. So there yeah. does seem to be patterns of things. Um, and it's possible uh, that the uh, that the writer of Second Kings is actually trying to cause you to look at the parallelism between Asherah and um, Jezebel as she's standing by the window. Um, there is a specific theologian, uh, Dr. Susan Ackerman, uh, who writes about this a little bit. She suggests that there are these ivory tablets uh, that were found, uh, and these ivory, there's about nine of them, uh, that have this picture of this god that stands in the window, um, and, and she's gazing out into uh, the individuals. And apparently this is a popular piece of ivory, uh, it's a kind of popular uh, uh uh, carving that had taken place. Uh, anyway, it, it's possible, she suggests, it, even probable, that uh, Jezebel going to the window to speak to Jehu is trying to parallel Asherah in the window and Jezebel in the window, like trying to create a correlation between uh, Jezebel and Asherah. So potential, but we can see, I think, a sexual immorality that's that's present here in the text as well. Yeah. Yeah, and you also see the intimidation thing later in the story with Elijah. Like after Elijah has this great victory on Mount Carmel, and you think Elijah is going to like, you know, take back over for the good guys. But uh, in 1 Kings 19, she threatens to take Elijah's life, and Elijah's like, oh no, and he gets all scared. But you once again see this intimidation. So it's this sort of like, sometimes she's real under handed manipulative and sometimes she's over the top coercive but both of these come together in the person of Jezebel uh, so uh, we also have she was the daughter of a pagan king she was likely a cult priestess and uh, and so uh, Josh actually why don't you dive into or uh, Miller either one of you her being a high priestess for it you're muted. Josh, we can't hear you, bro. Every time. The technical de demons. Um, uh, the high priestess bit uh, comes from uh, a theologian that suggests that... Um, let me, I think I have the quote up here. Let me pull this up and... Likely a cult priestess. There we go. Okay. 
the Phoenicians uh, followed the Mesopotamian practice of adopting the king's daughter as the high priestess of the chief local god, in this case, Baal uh, uh, Melkator, I can't say that word, and that's ridiculous. Uh, what the king uh, as high priest uh, and his daughter serving as high priestess uh, links between the monarchy and the state religion were considerably strengthened. Together, the two were able to uh, wield substantial political, economic, and religious power over the land. Hence, the Jezebel. Uh, hence, when Jezebel came to Israel, she was accustomed to being an active participant in governing uh, or government. Uh, she uh, promoted the cult of Baal, uh, which had long uh, enjoyed extensive support in Israel since her uh, status as uh, the god's high priestess was integral to her authority as queen. So uh, this, again, suggestive that she was highly probable a cult priestess. Uh, I don't think every theologian is going to speak with the level of certainty that this one does. Uh, it does seem to, uh, mm -hmm. that there's a mixed uh, presentation, but I do think it's probable um, that she was a cult priestess uh, for Asherah uh, in the temple there. So the, the point that he's making sort of implies that her status as a high priestess combined with the <laughs> king of Israel was meant to uh, heighten that level of power well, and unity within Israel to worship ba Baal. Don't you think? Specifically, like specifically, that, that it's her father to marry her. Yes. Right, right. Yes, yes, yes. The yes, decision yes. to to have the king of Israel marry a high priestess of Baal is actually meant, on some level, to bring those two things together—the state and that particular cult—to uh, make it more of the religion of Israel. Is that would that be accurate? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, w again, walking through those parallels, um, we've we see a pattern, a character emerging, if you will. Um, of a person who is idolatrous, a person that's sexually immoral, but but she's also got like this leadership bent. Like when we're talking about this one, she's a cult priestess. I mean, she's used to being in a position of authority and power and leading in manipulation and sexual immorality, uh, fear mongering, those kinds of things are things that she's practiced in. Uh, Michael, do you want to you wanna tackle the New Testament verse now that we kind of laid an Old Testament foundation for who Jezebel is, what she did? Uh, do you want to you wanna take us to uh, Revelation real quick? Yeah, sure. So Revelation 2 is where this comes up again, and you see Jezebel's name again in the New Testament. So it looks like we have up there on the screen verses 20 to 23. This is uh, the letter to the church in Thyatira. So uh, this is a church. There are, I mean, because it's a church, we would expect that there are lots of believers or just some believers in this church. It's an open question whether Jezebel is a believer. We'll talk about that. Uh, or the person called Jezebel. Uh, but let me uh, read the verses and we'll just begin to talk through them. Uh, verse 20, chapter 2. Uh, but I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to, pr to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw, uh, I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am He who searches minds and hearts, and I will give to each according to your works. So, who is this person? Uh, almost certainly, there was a person teaching in Thyatira, not actually named Jezebel, but owns this label, just like in the prior church in Pergamum, uh, there are teachers who follow the way of Balaam. And then prior to that, earlier in chapter two, those who follow the way of the Nicolaitans. And, um, and, and so you have these different sort of labels for these false teachers. So there's a false teacher in Thyatira who has influenced lots of people. Uh, two major works of hers are, she's, are sexual immorality and idolatry, which we've already seen are strongly associated with the Old Testament character of Jezebel. And so the question is, does this, first question is, is Jezebel a believer or not? Uh, I would suggest that she is a non-believer uh, in this text, and uh, and the reason is because Jezebel was so wicked in the Old Testament, uh, just like Balaam is associated with false teachers uh, under Pergamum, Balaam, a clear unbeliever, uh, 
once again, Jezebel, a clear unbeliever. Uh, and uh, But it, she is having influence upon believers within this church. And, uh, and within this text, Jesus calls her to repent. And that's going to be really relevant in deciding is is this text teaching, and I'll throw this over to you, uh, Michael and Josh, is this text teaching that the that the false teacher in Thyatira was demonically her name was, her name was her name was Judy, and she just had the spirit of Jezebel. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That she had the spirit what? of Jezebel. Or is Jezebel being used as sort of like a, a type, an anti-type, that this is uh, a sort of uh, character set that just saying this person's a lot like Jezebel? Or is there some sort of combination of those? What do you guys think? Well, okay, I was going to mention this earlier about Jezebel herself, the, the actual historical woman written about in Kings. Uh, Anybody who's practicing idolatry, sexual immorality, uh, manipulation, and murder is probably like that's those are several big open doors for all kinds of uh, <laughs> demonic stuff. And so, uh, is this woman, is there a spirit behind that's motivating and taking great pleasure at the pain this woman is causing others and the sins that she's committing? I, I, I it would be hard pressed for me to say otherwise. So, there's no doubt that there's a spiritual connection taking place with these kind of sins. Uh, and I do find it interesting that Jesus clearly has no problem calling this woman Jezebel, though that's probably not her given name. And I think the the Sam Storms article you sent us, I think it's actually from Sam Storms Spiritual War Warfare book, because I've read it before. Uh, I mean, to, by this point in time, he said that to call somebody a Jezebel, that was sort of a, a euphemism for calling somebody a scumbag, you know, <laughs> manipulator kind of person. Um, if it, I called someone entirely... like a Fabio, like, man, that, that is just a Fabio, you would think, okay, it's a muscular, muscular dude with long hair. Right. Like, there's yes. like this correlation, like, oh, I'm, I'm giving a character profile of an individual. Right, right. right. And I think that's what, what he was saying is at this point in time, that's probably, they're probably accustomed to that very thing. The name Jezebel becomes associated with that kind of characteristic. Um, but the other thing he mentions I thought was really funny was <laughs> it would be a rather cruel thing for a parent to name their child Jezebel. <laughs> that's, that's probably <laughs> not her actual name. <laughs> that was hilarious. Well, let, let me weigh in on this. Yeah. In, in, in Revelation, he mentions a statement right there. I think it's in 23. Um, he's like, hey, I've given her time to repent, right? I gave her time to repent, but she refused to repent of her sexual immorality. Now, this can't be a spirit. Like, Jesus isn't giving a spirit an opportunity to repent. He's giving an individual the opportunity to repent. And I, again, I would side with Michael. Is it possible that there is a spirit attached to a person who's performing idolatry? I mean, we see throughout the Old Testament that you're offering up to what you think is a god, but it's actually a demon. So the kind of, uh, you know, ritual sacrifice, offering up food to idols, those kinds of things were regularly called demonic activities, demonic worship. Um, when, so it's totally kind of possible. Sacrifice, child sacrifice to boot. I mean, the, the kinds sure. of sacrifices that were taking place to these these deities, Asherah and, and Baal, were not just... Well, know, I meant in particular in the... Nails. I'm particularly in Revelation. I, I know, I, I know. Yeah, I'm, yeah, just, yeah. I'm just saying even further. So you would expect <clears throat> that's how that's how evil this stuff actually is. But let let's right. consider like the way that the word spirit is actually used in the New Testament. You know, like uh, John the Baptist um, coming in the spirit. Elisha, Eli, uh, the John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. Like, do, does uh -huh. that mean that there was an actual like like Samuel's spirit calls up from the grave? Like the spirit of Elijah actually came on John the Baptist. How are we to think through some of that? Because I think that there's probably a similar parallel. Right. So you're using spirit in the in that case, like John the Baptist came in the spirit or the sort of character or profile yeah. of Elijah. Character he, ministry. He came Maybe even like calling him. would be a good word for it. Right. Yeah. But. You know, John wasn't a literal Elijah, nor was John, nor was there like, like a a spirit of some kind of Elijah, is in a spiritual entity of Elijah inhabiting uh, John the Baptist. Anyway, certainly there wasn't that. 
I want to come back, Josh, to uh, to Revelation. I think it's important for us to pay attention to the kind of book this is. Revelation is a book of fulfillment. I mean, uh, there are over well over 400 allusions to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation, many verses alluding to, uh, like individual verses alluding to two and three and four different Old Testament verses. Uh, Revelation is the book of fulfillment. It's what everything was pointing to. It's like, hey, all things are fulfilled in this book. This is what the whole, uh, the the message of the Old Testament was pointing to. So you see, for instance, Exodus themes repeating and plagues of blood, and you see uh, something like a plague of frogs and Revelation 16. And, and so you see lots of this repetition. So it's not just here in Revelation 2 where Jezebel is mentioned. It's the entire book is filled with this theme of, of type and anti-type where the Old mm -hmm. Testament has these types and shadows pointing forward. So with that said, we have to ask ourselves the question, uh, given the type of book that Revelation is, is it likely that John is trying to teach us about a certain kind of demon called a Jezebel demon or a Jezebel spirit? Or is it more likely that in keeping with the rest of the book, he is following in line with this sort of types and shadows where you had Jezebel in the Old Testament and man, she was really bad. But here's sort of a greater eschatological expression of the person of Jezebel taking place right here in the church of Thyatira. And given that this is one of the seven churches, seven being the number of completion, we know that this, while it was written to seven historical churches, it was also written to seven sort of types of churches that exist throughout the world in every age. And so there, there are churches of Thyatira you're letting today. your eschatology show. I can see it. Yeah, Michael. There you go. Yeah. So, well, and let me uh, let me ask a clarifying well, question, okay. Michael. Are, are you saying that the revelation, in keeping with revelation, you mean it's uh, John is using the same sort of rhetorical device device here with Jezebel that he's been using throughout the entirety of the book? Uh, absolutely. That being That's absolutely typology. What I'm yeah. That's absolutely what I'm saying. So I, th I think we have to pay attention to what kind of book this is instead of just picking one verse that mentions Jezebel's name and say, ah, see, there is a Jezebel spirit. We have to say, what was John trying to teach here? Was John trying not... to teach us that there is a Jezebel demon that attacks leaders and seduces and, and does all of these things? I don't think John was trying to teach that. I think John was trying to show that there is an eschatological expression of the person of Jezebel in the form of false teachers and false prophets slash prophetesses who uh, use their spiritual gift in order to manipulate people and get them to do godless things uh, that, that will in the end result in uh, in judgment against unbelievers, discipline against believers. And so that that is, it is, so here's where I would agree with my charismatic brothers and sisters. I would, uh, who believe that there is a real Jezebel spirit. I would say, yeah, this is something that we need to watch out for this sort of character, this sort of profile, but I'm certainly not going to dogmatically teach that there's a, there's a Jezebel demon out to get you. You mean like an, uh, a spiritual entity, that's named Jezebel, uh, that's behind all Jezebel activity. Is that kind of what you mean? Right. Yeah. And yeah. It, but, uh, it, Josh, was it you that was talking earlier about like, yeah, for sure there or no, it was you Miller for sure. There are demons involved. Like if somebody's sure. acting oh, yeah. like Je if somebody's acting like Jesse B for sure, there's a spirit behind that. Absolutely, right? I mean, you have but to ask like, yourself, was there a spirit behind Jezebel? Because I think like the actual historical sure Jezebel. Support. This, this should add support to the argument you're making, Michael, with the use of the heavy use of typology throughout Revelation. It's not just John who does this, although John does it not only here, he also does it in his letters, his epistles. Um, and you think about the, the word antichrist and how that gets used. Um, and there's one verse of scripture, I, I can't remember if it's John or Paul who says this, but he says there have been many, many antichrists already. John, yeah, um, yeah, first John 4. And, and, right so that and then you see you see uh reformers using similar kind of language when they talk about uh the pope i mean luther called him an antichrist and so he's he's following a similar tradition or at least uh, 
I would, I would imagine on some level has, has very similar feelings. Um, although <laughs> Luther may have actually just thought he was the one and only antichrist, <laughs> but he certainly was he for sure the one did. persecuting. There's no maybe there. Yeah. He for sure did. Well, I, I, but I don't think he would have also said that there hasn't been other antichrists sure, uh, along sure, sure, the sure. way and that, that the Pope may just be the culminating one in his mind. I mean, many of us today, you know, my family being Jewish, we would have considered Hitler an antichrist, uh, actually exterminating mm-hmm. Jews. Um, and so, and I don't think that's far from the truth. He was leading people into pagan uh, idolatry and he was <clears throat> committing acts of murder, uh, very much against those who would who would worship the God of the Bible. So... But let's let's take a, a like another historical look real quick at at the historic person Jezebel in the Old Testament. You have a person who is probably a high priestess <laughs> of Asherah who's practicing what is called sympathetic magic. Um, this idea that you can do physical things to lure um, the spiritual beings, right? So so if you have uh, an orgy here on Earth, then you know Baal and Asherah will come together and have an, an orgy, and then and that will cause a fruitful season to come <laughs> upon your land. So you have a woman who's the high priestess of this organization who is pra- at least practicing it. We know she worships Asherah. So she's practicing these sorts of things. Um, she's murdering folk. She's manipulating situations. She's coming in uh, to Elisha and just tells this man who has slaughtered hundreds of prophets of false god worship by fire falling down from heaven and then says, hey, I'm going to kill you. And then he runs. Like, I, it's hard for me to think that there's not some kind of demonic force that is trying to intimidate Elijah. Like, I, I think that the person, Jezebel, actually had a demonic spirit empowering her influence. You know, I think of guys like 100%. Hitler, people like Hitler, they could speak for oh, yeah. two hours at a time and people were captivated. Like, you can't tell me that guy wasn't demonically empowered somehow to have that kind of retention and to, to affect that kind of murder and slaughter of the innocent. Like, that's just, these things are demonic, whether it's directly <laughs> AD men, it's definitely demonic experientially when i've uh, been i mean i've been a part of casting out demons even recently uh anytime i've actually seen one manifest where like the person that you were talking to is suddenly gone and you're now you're now staring into the uh, the i don't know i don't know how how you would how do you just describe it in words but suddenly you feel this presence of great evil and you're not like it it's suddenly a keen awareness of true evil intent to harm you and harm the person this this demon is possessing um it is terrifying it it causes a level of fear that i cannot describe that suddenly comes upon you and not to say that that we should ever stay in that place the lord uh, has when i've actually had these kind of experiences um the lord has always showed up with an incredible amount of peace to overcome it um even hearing uh, things like do not fear and suddenly going oh with the power that suddenly removes fear yeah. in my heart. Well, but I would say that those entities actually cause an overwhelming pervasive sense of fear. Like suddenly you're standing in a smoke cloud. That's how it feels. Yeah, yeah for sure. So I, I want to come back to what you were saying, Josh, like if we all agree, whether it be a Hitler, like you mentioned Miller or uh, Josh, like you mentioned, Jezebel was for sure influenced by demons. There's no way you, you go to that level of wickedness and it's not demonically inspired in some way. Why do the three of us seem so uncomfortable labeling this a Jezebel spirit if Jezebel herself was influenced by spirits? And according to Revelation 2, people are repeating her sin, certainly influenced by spirits and probably the same kinds of spirits. Maybe we can make that deduction what why do the three of us seem to be so uncomfortable with saying yes there is a jezebel spirit couple a couple of reasons uh bj allen asked a great question that kind of ties into that same thing um are demons a primary cause of all the world's troubles right so i think this is the problem that we're having is one when we start talking about jezebel spirits um there's a lack of responsibility that starts get, taking place right I, i've seen groups of individuals um, use a prophetic discernment gift to look out into the spiritual ether and identify individuals as Jezebels, right? With no evidence, uh, comes into the church and they can just see the spirit of Jezebel uh, on them. Mm -hmm. And they're like, that's a Jezebel. And they tell all the men of the church, let's, you know, get away from that person, you know, and and what that assumes to, to BJ's questions, it assumes that Jezebel is the active cause of all sin, right? 
rather than looking at that individual and saying that that's a human person that can choose to act badly. And what we should do is if there is a spirit that's leading this person into sexual immorality and manipulation, those kinds of things, we should surround ourselves around that person, love them, care for them, uh, 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 you know, in, investigate their life, ask them, hey, what's going on? You know, hey, I was praying about you the other day and I just got this sense that you were wrestling. You know, can I pray for you in this area? Like just investigate the situation, care for that individual and see them restored. That's the whole point of, of God giving a prophetic word like this would not be so that you could have some spiritual insight to, to hide your kids, hide your wife, which is, by the way, part of the thumbnail. Um, uh, you know, that whole that whole bit, that it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, I see, you know, this witchcraft. I see this sexual immorality on this person. And then they fulfill that prophetic word and they go, oh, look how spiritual I am. Like, no, dude, a spiritual right. person would go and restore well, that individual. Yeah. I mean, if I've it's wrong to demonize happen. people... If it's wrong to demonize people, I mean, it's taken it to a whole new level to to say of them that you have a demon, and if they don't, I mean, <laughs> well, like to just straight up label them. This Jenny, literally, you know, this literally has happened in my story. life, but you as well, Miller. Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking of a time when I was doing uh, the equipping classes that I used to do back in Dallas. I had a whole team of of people that would help me, and we had this one young man come in who, um, I mean, pretty apparently uh was into some new age practice but some of the guys on my team were seeing demonic stuff around him and so they immediately start getting into fear mode and warning mode and and uh, when i saw this happen uh, this was not my reaction at uh, fortunately i i think i knew better at the time um, but i immediately rebuked all of them for immediately demonizing this person rather than caring for somebody whether whether what they're seeing is true or not um, they didn't start with caring for that person and so instead uh, i actually got to befriend him and it turns out you know they were actually right they were some of the things that he was into were definitely new age but what was also right was to befriend him and love him and earn the right to be heard and actually show him, hey, like some of the stuff you're doing is actually causing you to be attacked and demonized because it's new age practice. Um, mm -hmm. And that actually has carried over into a friendship into this day. Um, but but that is that's the potential when you start seeing stuff and then labeling people. What you're doing is you're not actually setting the demonized free. You're demonizing the person and isolating them by rejecting mm -hmm. them carte blanche. And that's not helpful. Yeah. Uh, Giant Gia in the chat says, uh, refers to all the women who called me Jezebel. I felt, she says, I felt they had a spirit of jealousy. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh OMG, it gets wild. Calling people out on their spirits they carry or think, or they think we carry. Uh, okay. And this is a challenging deal. Okay. Discernment of spirits is a real thing. Sure. And Paul identifies, you know, this woman, uh, this young lady in Acts 16 who has a spirit of divination. Um, and Jesus in Acts 13 will will cast out a, 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 a disabling spirit. And uh, there are deaf spirits and mute spirits. He'll say, deaf spirit, mute spirit, come out of this person, you know, whatever. Um, discernment, uh, now, of course, for certain ones, you, you don't necessarily have to have that much discernment, right? Like, well, the person's deaf and mute. But, um, but to know there's a spirit behind it, I suppose you do. So uh, there is a place for discernment of spirits. Uh, how do you know when it's like gone too far and you're just throwing out the Jesse B label on people and uh, they don't even have that and you're not even walking in discernment of spirits? I mean, how, how, can, uh, how can we walk, how can we actually use the gift of discernment of spirits without suddenly labeling people when we do see something demonic? Yeah, I mean, that's... And, and that, outright rejecting them because of that label or because of what you think you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. outright, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the gifts are for the edification, right? Therefore, yeah. we're building up the church, 1 Corinthians 13. Um, if the gifts aren't done through that kind of funnel of love, they're just a clinging gong and a resounding symbol. And that's exactly what I was seeing and I think what Michael was seeing is we're seeing individuals in the mm -hmm. church that had an authentic prophetic gift that could see someone was actually wrestling with someone something, God was revealing this to them, and rather than exercising that gift well, they needed to be trained in that spiritual gift in a way to more excellently pursue love uh, and, and see uh, that gift exercised in a way where we love our neighbor uh, and not using the gift for selfish ambition, right? 
Don't use mm-hmm. tongues to feel good about yourself. Don't use prophecy to protect you and your family, but use prophecy to go after the kingdom. of. It's not like me and mine. It's for them and theirs. Like, let's see Christ edified in our brothers. It's a gift to be given away. That's right. Not to be Hoarded. self-protective. When I, I think by way of analogy, I would say like uh, if you were to get a word of knowledge that somebody in your congregation had a particular illness, the automatic application is usually to go and pray for that person to be healed, right? Well, Mm -hmm. the same thing should be true if you, by the the gift of discernment of spirits, sees that somebody has a Jezebel spirit. Well, that right there is an invitation for you to go and love them and befriend them in in order to get them free from whatever whatever they're afflicted by. Not, not to say that I actually buy into the actual spirit entity Jezebel, um, but I'm just, I'm just say. saying if you're seeing something like that, um, that would be how you approach it in the same way that you approach yeah. a word of knowledge let's, for healing. Let's do this. Healing, you approach a discernment of spirits to bring deliverance. Let, let's run through some of these examples and I can just get like a carte blanche, yes or no to these things. Because what I hear you guys both saying, yes, I believe that there are demonic spirits. Yes, I believe they can influence and empower all kinds of sin including sexual immorality and manipulation. So let's look, this is a quote from John Paul Jackson, okay? This I would categorize as the spirit of Jezebel is a demonic spirit and or principality, okay? Um, The enemy has always sought to silence God's prophetic voices and abort intercessory prayer. Its name is Jezebel, a diabolical spiritual force that seeks to deceive, defile, and destroy God's uh, authorities. While the term Jezebel spirit is used in some charismatic circles, few people truly understand how the demonic force operates. A Jezebel spirit is celestial power that has a, a worldwide influence. It's not simply a demon that possesses an individual. It's a demonic power in the heavenly realms that transcends specific geographical boundaries and can affect nations uh, without... Hey, uh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, hate it. I, I <laughs> yeah. just said, I just said, hate it. But Pre- keep prematurely. Going. No, no. Uh, that's basically the Sorry. gist. I, I hate it. <laughs> now, here's the thing. John Paul Jackson loved the Lord. He went home to be with the Lord and he was insanely prophetic. Okay. So this, this is not against John Paul Jackson. Uh, I, I think he was, from what I understand, he was a very godly man and did some great things for the kingdom. I hate that quote. Okay. And, and the reason is, how does he know this? Scripture, please. Where, where's the verse? Yeah. The answer is he doesn't know it. And when I asked you guys, uh, you know, why are we not, e- even though we could kind of work our way through logic to the point of like, yeah, some people act like Jezebel and it's demonically inspired. And I suppose someone might call it a Jezebel spirit. Like you can kind of back into it. Here is why I'm not going to, I'm never going to teach this. I'm never going to teach anything like this uh, is, is because the Bible does not teach it. The Bible does not teach that there is such thing as a Jezebel spirit. Might there be a Jezebel spirit? There might be. There might be. But there might be a gazillion different kinds of spirits. There might be a stub your toe spirit for all I care. I mean, I don't know. Spirits do lots of, <laughs> lots of mess, right? But like, if I want to actually win the spiritual battle, it has nothing to do with understandings, the inner workings of spirits and their names and their hierarchies and where they stand in the hierarchy. Like it, it's all speculation. And there's so much of the Bible that I do know that I have trouble enacting in my life. Why am I going to put loads of focus on that which I don't know and mm-hmm. just speculate mm-hmm. about? And then what I do is I put this out there and I promote myself as I'm an expert on the Jezebel spirit. Mm -hmm. And here, hey, the Jezebel spirit operates in the second heaven. The Jezebel, yeah, I could write a book about the Jezebel spirit. People are like, oh man, I've read the Bible, but I don't know anything about the Jezebel spirit. I got to read Michael Roundtree's book about Jezebel spirit. Well, I'd read hey, it. maybe the reason there you you've read the whole Bible and you don't know anything about the Jezebel spirit is because the Bible says nothing <laughs> about a Jezebel spirit. Maybe that's why. And maybe if you want victory in a spiritual battle, you need to know zilch about a Jezebel spirit. You need to know nothing. You could have never heard about the Jezebel spirit and been incredibly victorious in spiritual battle. Or you could have heard loads about a Jezebel spirit, and it won't make a bit of a difference. So I would just say, why are we going to worry about vain speculation? That is all this is. It's vain speculation. Maybe it's true, Uh, and it doesn't matter. Someone needs to get Michael a sweat rag after that that sermon. 
My, well, my Lord. I'm going to... I'm going to probably take a softer stance on it, which, you know, obviously I get accused of on this podcast a lot. Um, because you got a Jezebel so, spirit, bro. Bro. Right. Must you. be. That's it. <laughs> Sis. Uh, I think with with this particular quote from John Paul Jackson, uh, most of us would recognize John Paul Jackson as a true prophet uh, that, that has passed on to be with the Lord. Um, and I think part of John Paul Jackson's teaching here may not be come from a clear explicit scriptural reference but might come from his personal experience sure. and i think there's a danger to teaching our personal experience as though they're absolutely true however just because we don't see something in the scripture explicitly stated doesn't mean that it's not there either so it may actually very well be there i would say you know if i were in if i was john john paul jackson and i had seen this spirit like flat out had an encounter with this principality type Jezebel thing. Um, then I would just say it is, you know, I had this experience. Here's how I interpret this experience. Um, <coughs> I, I can't equivocally say like undoubtedly that this is biblical. Um, so, and I, I do understand why, uh, you know, there's a lot of speculative stuff out there, which is probably part of uh, Roundtree's response to this stuff is we're kind of tired of seeing some of these speculations presented as absolute truth. Um, when, which really can't be validated by the scripture one way or the other. And so I think that's what we're seeing here with this John Paul Jackson quote. Um, is it possibly true that there is this out there? Um, yeah, it's, it's quite possibly true. Um, is there any scriptural proof for it? No, there isn't. Um, was John Paul Jackson credible as far as uh, prophecy goes? Yeah, I, I think so. I think he had a track record that was pretty darn specific and accurate. And I mean, the number of, of, much worthy people that three of us all know who would also testify to John Paul Jackson's uh, prophetic gift uh, causes me to go, uh, I'd listen to it. But at the end of the day, the question is, is what's that going to do for me? By knowing that there's yeah. a Jezebel principality, what does it actually do for me? That, that's Here's where... what I know. Whether whether oh, I know that there's a, that's right. Whether I know that there's a Jezebel principality or not, I'm still going to discourage sexual immorality. I'm still going to correct idolatry when I see it. I'm still, and, and those things are all explicitly, explicitly stated, which is how we deal with any principality. We, we deal with it with individuals causing them to repent of sin and preach the gospel. Yeah, and this is, uh, I'll have like probably a mediated position between the two of you in that um, I will not ever teach and would encourage everyone not to teach anything they don't find in the Bible. What Miller is saying is that you're not denying that potentially there is a spirit that, ha that fits that characteristic, of which I will also say, at least potentially plausible, uh, without with, with with no with no um, sense of con no no confidence that I have that I can say for sure I know that there is a spirit that has these characteristics. But I'm at least willing to mm -hmm. say there probably is. Maybe yeah. Why why wouldn't there be a spirit that has these characteristics? We see spirits leading people after other gods. We see spirits uh, leading people into immorality. Why not a spirit that does like both a, of those things? Like a spirit that yeah. gets all like gussied up. Puts yeah. on the makeup. You know, gussied. You've said that <laughs> in the prep a couple of times. I you just wanted to say it. He really <laughs> likes the word gussy. I think you're looking for the word hussy, <laughs> Michael. Were you saying hussy? <laughs> hussy? No. no? <laughs> I said gussy. But, okay. You know, whatever. That's okay. What we say in the South for like putting on a whole bunch of makeup, you know. But, uh, we say in the okay, south. So, I've never so heard this in my entire did, life. Michael, you would gussy yes. yourself up. Michael has gussied himself. Yes, yes, he has. That's exactly. I don't have a exactly Jesse his spirit, reference. So I've never gussied myself up like that. So, yeah. So um, <laughs> it would be. So it, Josh, it, it sounds like you're pro Jesse B. No. So oh, I'd be very clear in saying that I think that there are people who can create a theological category and name that category. So in the same way that we don't see a Bible verse in all of scripture that says Trinity, but we use Trinity as a shorthand to specifically articulate um, the doctrine of God in that he is one essence in three persons, one God uh, in three persons, uh, how, how that actually works out. We use the shorthand of Trinity to talk about a theological shorthand. Um, I can see yeah. an individual having a category saying, I think there's a demonic force that leads people into sexual immorality and the worship of idols. Um, and I'm going to shorthand call that a spirit of Jezebel. I wouldn't teach on that authoritative. I wouldn't, I wouldn't teach on it periodly. You know, like the idea of okay. authoritatively is unnecessary. But to say, is someone going to have that in a category in their head? I, I don't think that's ex inex like well, unreasonably wrong. Yeah. So like I'm personally just never gonna include that in a teaching ever. <laughs> Agreed, 100% agree. And the 
Yeah, uh, I don't think I would either. even in informal in an informal setting, even in like a one on one discipleship, I would never refer to it. Um, and, and maybe part of it, is maybe I'm a little reactive to it, but I just uh, I, I get uh, wary of um, wary and weary of uh, <laughs> charismatics when they talk about the demonic, yes, having these teachings that are completely unfounded in scripture. Yeah, come to me and get the secret again. teaching. Yeah, and I and that, I, I, really I think it's it dangerous. You're tired of the, I think it's the, dangerous the because this Gnostic is, tendencies. Yeah, we. I I don't Special need knowledge. secret knowledge that goes Agreed. beyond. Like, uh, to use a Lord of the Rings equivalent, a few people might get this. Like, I don't need a Silmarillion. Okay, the Lord of the Rings trilogy was enough. <laughs> you got that, didn't <laughs> hey, you, Josh? That Silmarillion, the, the Silmarillion was good, man. Like, I loved it. It's like is it yeah, it was cool. But we're we're not talking about Holy Scripture here, so. Like Agreed. getting a few extra deets, like I, I don't need that from John Paul Jackson uh, teaching me right. authoritatively Agreed. on things that he has no way of knowing. He's, Agreed. So, well, and to be, to be I, fair, I'm against that's it. not the only thing John Paul Jackson said. That was just one thing in a book that by and large might have actually been rather helpful. I've, I've not read the whole thing. I've only read chunks of it. Uh, Josh, would you agree with that? I did not find it helpful. I don't mean to be like I don't want to be mean. I don't want to be mean. No, no, that's good. But like, I, like I, Miller, I read, I read we, all, we do, we do love your gestures of niceness. You help Josh yes. and I. You help uh, Josh be yeah. nicer. Nice. So, so Thank here's you. there. There's a there's another book that I found that was interesting, and in that um, the reason for the book I found really odd, and I found not good. But then the actual contents <laughs> of the book, I was like, okay, I like this. Um, Dr. Michael Brown published a book. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Brown, I, he published a book on uh, the spirit of Jezebel and its war with America. And I was like, oh no. And there was, he starts off the book explaining <laughs> why he started the book. Um, well, that title is total clickbait, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, he starts the book because uh, John Kilpatrick gave a prophetic word saying that in, in 2019, hey, Trump has dealt with Ahab up until this point, but he's about to deal with Jezebel. Like, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but like, just, just wait and see. Like, there's going to be a huge turnaround. We're going to see, you know, Trump deal with Jezebel now. And, uh, and Dr. Michael Brown was like, okay, like he, he, he wrote a book in like two weeks, basically giving an apologetic defense of this prophetic word. And I was just like, ew, <laughs> gross. You know, like, I didn't like that, that, uh, he was explaining it, but like the actual, the contents of the book were actually good. Like I, I thought that it was, it was a good book. Um, it, it's not, it's not necessarily an academic book as much as it is again, identifying the character profiles of Jezebel and then saying, are these ideologies demonic? Killing the unborn, is that demonic? Is uh, sexual immorality demonic? Is Are these things evil? Yes, they're evil. They're strongholds. They're bad ways of thinking. We'll look at these kinds of things being taught um, throughout our nation uh, and look how there are similar parallels. And I go, oh, okay. So he's using a nationalistic scope over our entire nation. Not an individual, not a person. You've got a spirit of Jezebel. But looking over, you know, nationally, there are certain thinkings and ideologies that we have that line up with the character profiles of Jezebel. Uh, I've got a quote in here from Doc Brown that I'll let you guys respond to. Uh, he said, this is, this is demonic ideology. So we talked about Jezebel as a spirit. Now this is Jezebel as a demonic ideology. Uh, put another way, we know that human beings are fully responsible for their actions and cannot say, the devil made me do it. But we also know Amen. that Satan is our ultimate enemy, the one uh, whom we do battle. Uh, as Paul wrote, for our fight is not against flesh and blood, and principalities, powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual forces uh, of evil in the heavenly places. Uh, uh, that's why Jezebel had such power. She was not simply a domineering, manipulative woman. She was demonically empowered as well. Hence, her almost supernatural ability to intimidate and control. Uh, and when we see this same type of demonic activity at work uh, in our day, we identify it as the spirit of Jezebel. This doesn't mean that there's a specific demon or principality named Jezebel. It means that there are certain characteristics associated with Jezebel. And when we see this same set of characteristics at, characteristics at work, we know who is behind it. But another way, we observe the same thing happening in our society or within our churches as it happened in Israel in Jezebel's day. We understand uh, it it's no coincidence. It is satanic, it is systematic, and it's intentional. And that's why I say Jezebel is alive and well today in the 21st century America. I got no problem with that. Like when I when I, I read that, no I go, I, I go, okay, yeah, demonic characteristics, yeah. but they're thoughts. Instead of a person, it's a thought. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't mind that. I think though that when he says this is what we mean by the spirit of Jezebel, I don't think that's what most people mean by the spirit 1, of Jezebel. One thousand percent what, agree with you. I, I, I think what Michael Brown yeah. means by it, like we're kind of like, okay. But I think what everybody else means by it when they're talking about the spirit of Jezebel. John Paul is, Zach, Jackson, for example. Is the demon that's making people get all gussied up. And uh, <laughs> the spirit and, of hope that yeah. they're that they're. <laughs> wait, wait. Yeah, I said it. Did, did, I said it. Said it. <laughs> I said it. Okay. So here's a, here's a, here's the 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 the, the connection let's is just, that. Let's just stop. Right Dr. There. Brown, yeah, Dr. Brown does apologetics for the charismatic space and often the hyper charismatic space, um, of which I very much disagree with. So I, I think I agree with you that he is saying, "Hey, this is what we mean." When does he say we? What is who does he mean by we? Right? What's the meaning of is is? When he says we, does he mean him and John Kilpatrick, or does he mean him and the charismatic movement at large? Because I would say by and large, the charismatic hyper charismatic movement typically talks about, and I don't even think that this has to be hyper charismatic. I think all for the majority of charismatics, when they say spirit of Jezebel, they're thinking in terms of John Paul Jackson. They're not thinking well, in terms mm -hmm. of Dr. Michael Brown. That's right. That's right. For Which and to be clear, there that John. Read, uh, brown's book those who read his book are gonna end up going uh yeah that's what i mean by it from now on <laughs> yeah i hope so i hope it's so good that he wrote please it. please do <laughs> yeah 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 and, and to be clear the difference between what Br uh, michael brown is saying what john paul jackson is saying john paul jackson is saying this is a demon it attacks leaders it does it's a principality it does these things so very much like what we expect in the charismatic space Whereas Michael Brown is coming in and saying, well, it's really a personality profile. There are Jezebel-like people out there doing Jezebel-like things. And it's certainly demonically inspired. And we just call that the Jezebel spirit. So, so it's a little bit like if we take the three views of it's a spirit, it's a personality profile. Brown takes the middle ground and says, it's a personality profile influenced by demons. But even in saying that, I'm pretty sure that everybody who ascribes to the personality profile uh, interpretation is going to say, well, yeah, of course it's inspired by demons. So to me, he he's taking a mitigating route, but really he's number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, let's, I've got a question here though. Amber has a question because she's, I think, upset with the way Michael keeps using gussied because she's like, I want to get gussied. Like, uh, why not put on makeup? You're not saying like getting ready and making yourself oh, presentable no. he's, he's is being, sinful. Are you, Michael? You're being oh, silly. Oh, yeah. Please clarify, Michael. <laughs> yeah, it's it's OK. Your wife makeup. gets gussied, right? My wife gets gussied up for a good yeah, special occasion. Absolutely. Yeah. Or, you know, when she walks out the door, you know, like, <laughs> there, are, just... there are people in the comments who are like straight up condemned because of your joke. How dare oh, you? Oh, no. We're just, <laughs> if we're you're just from beings. Dallas, you get gussied up to go outside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. We're, exactly. We're being silly. We're certainly not saying yeah, we're, we're it's not a sin to wear makeup or yeah. a sin to kind of gussy yourself up some. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I don't Michael, know. I don't even putting Michael's like not a using scale the term. On it. Like, he's not using the term. He's not using the term. One to ten. It, the, the problem wasn't like how gussied up she was getting. The problem was what she was doing, right? right. What she was trying to He's achieve. About She's trying to seduce Jay. She's trying yeah. to seduce. So if your goal is to seduce, then yeah, you getting gussied up would be bad. Okay, Amber because Amber knew that you were joking. Seduction. That's good. She's like, hey, I knew he Amber was knew. She was just kidding. Okay. I was like, I, it was like the, make, the second or third this, time I saw her like make a comment like that. And I was like, oh no, you've got to, oh, you got to no. tighten your use of gussy this, up. This happens bro. to me sometimes. I just joke around, <laughs> you know, some, somebody was asking me recently, I guess I made a joke about flag waivers on one of my, one of our episodes. I was like, I got no problem with flag waivers. It's cool. It could, you can flag wave in church and they're like, oh, okay. You know, somebody, I mean, I'm not a flag waver. I don't wave flags, but if someone else is pretty sure Jezebel there did. a flag wave and um, <laughs> <laughs> we, just, we just cut up on the show you see? Just so don't just, yeah don't pa take certain yeah. things don't take too seriously that's right so, that's right anyway all right so uh where we all stand on the jesse b spirit maybe there's such a thing as a jesse b spirit the bible does def or definitely does not teach it and as a broad principle let's stay away from teachings of speculation. Let's stay 100%. away from teachings that are trying to explore this in the angelic realm and this in the demonic realm and this is that demon's name and, and so on. Um, might a demon tell us its name? Yes. 
And might we cast the demon out by addressing it by the name that it tells us? Yes, that can happen. But we don't need to be going around just being like, oh, she has a little too much eyeshadow on. It's because she's a Jezzy B. Like, this is this is not good. I think we're all on the same page. I love this I see you pulled up a quote, question. Judy. I love this quote. Her name is Judy. Why did you say Jezebel's spirit? Her name is Judy. I find your comment offensive. Yes. Judy, Judy well timed. Well timed, Judy. Judy left well timed. Us a comment. Oh man, Dude. that was funny. Okay, uh, that was good. no, and and I, Sorry. I think I, Sorry, I agree. Judy, we we should I probably for Josh. We should probably, I would say, for a season, step away from Jezebel spirit talk because I think um, the the modern vernacular and the nomenclature of a word kind of gives that word its meaning. And I think by and large, when people use the word or phrase spirit of Jezebel, they they say it in a John Paul Jackson principality sort of way. So I would just like I would really encourage people. Way. Yeah, I would really encourage people not to use that phrase at all and, and refer to identifiable sins and say, I think this person wrestles with that sin or I think there may be a spirit of immorality here and I want to get involved and care for this person, see them repent of their sins, believe in Christ Jesus for their salvation, yeah. that kind of thing. I, I so think, I think what you're saying is get away. Away from, get away from name calling and actually care for these people that you may be saying 100%. something. Uh, learn how to love them and, t and make disciples, preach the gospel. Yeah, that's, cast, that's it. Cast out some Jesse Guys, Bees. I want to let you guys know we're at that, that kind of closing part of our show. But I, if you guys are new to Remnant Radio and you're like, hey, I want to learn about spiritual gifts, learn about devils, those kinds of things. We did release an ebook. Uh, it's on the gifts of the spirit, uh, specifically on how to hear God. So if you want to go check that out, there's links in the description. Though man may not perceive it, the ways that God speaks and why we miss what God is saying. <laughs> You can check that out in the links of the description. <laughs> We're also entirely crowdfunded. You can hear Michael back there coughing up a lung. He's going to need a surgery soon. So uh, maybe consider donating. There's links in the description oh for that. You can give gosh. on PayPal or <laughs> on Patreon. Say that. <laughs> it's, well, hey, I'm not going to speak it into existence, Michael. Um, <laughs> that's, well, that's a joke. Getting all word of faith on me. Okay, so so <laughs> there, there are links in the description for both PayPal and Patreon. If you want to donate, you can give on PayPal as one-time gift or you can give on Patreon reoccurring gift as low as five bucks a month and you get access to extra content there. So really encourage you guys to go pick up the ebook in uh, the description of the video and check out next week. We're coming out with episodes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Time and tomorrow at 4, maybe it'll be tomorrow at like 8 a.m. I'll probably release it in the morning. Uh, I'm going to release a video on uh, the ways that you can judge prophecy, six ways to judge prophecy. The video is already uploaded on YouTube. You can go hit a set of reminders so that when that's published, you're notified. Uh, but yeah, that's a short format video. It's like 15 minutes long and I think you'll enjoy it. Any, any other closing thoughts, gentlemen's? Just ah, I'll subscribe, see you guys. hit that like button. Yeah, sub it up. Two weeks yeah. later. I'm taking oh, yeah. next week. Hit the Miller's hit turning the like 40. Button. Have yeah. you already, you've already Miller's turned 40, 40, right? I can you feel I've already turned 40. Beginning of January. I'm just, I'm yeah. Gonna, yeah, I'm going to have some fun with bro. some buddies. And, okay. Yeah, taking the week off. Yeah, Josh actually used that pejoratively toward me and you, Miller. He's like, y'all are 40. Well, when I mentioned <laughs> that there was something on YouTube that's everywhere on YouTube, you guys were both like, what's YouTube? So I was like, yeah, you're, you're 40. <laughs> I forget. Josh, we're 40, but we have less gray hair than <laughs> you yeah. yeah, bro. I am like, I am working that gray hair. Genetics. Yes. Oh, <laughs> it should be dirty on this one. <laughs> okay, guys. Blessings. Right. We'll see you next week, guys.